left up to people's imaginations, people's concepts. Nothing's left up to anyone's thoughts, anyone's ideas. No one's ideas matter. Not even, you don't ever see Moses going to God saying, well, what if we do it this way? Even Moses' ideas didn't matter. Hmm? Well, that's why some of us are struggling here. That's why some of us, you've been living for God for a while, but you're struggling because you are too opinionated. You've got too many ideas. And I don't mean like if you have a lot of ideas, that's a bad thing. I mean that your ideas, you are insulted or you are ruled by them if you feel they are not followed. God blessed you with a good mind. He gave you the ability to get ideas. That's wonderful. But all ideas must be surrendered to God. Amen. All ideas must be given to God. All concepts given to God. Especially when you start talking about approaching him. All right, Exodus chapter 30, verse 17 through 21. We are now moving to the second piece of furniture, the brazen laver. Now, before I get into this, I need to redo something that I said yesterday. I don't think I made it clear enough. But in your handout, there is the image of the pieces of furniture in the shape of a cross. All right, get that a moment. I need to make something a little clearer than what I did yesterday. It's this one right here. It's all it's on the shape of the cross. And you, if you, as you study the tabernacle, you recognize all the furniture computes out basically to the shape of a cross. This is all Jesus. Now, I told you on yesterday that Jesus was pierced six times or six ways. Many times he's shown with a spike through both of his feet, but feet, they're too pierced. He's pierced in his side. He's pierced in each hand. And he's pierced in his head. Now, I need to make this a little clearer than yesterday. The first pierce, that's the brazen altar. The second pierce, because remember, he's pierced twice in his feet, that's the laver. Okay. The piercing in his hand, one hand, that's the candlestick. The piercing in the other hand, that's the showbread. The piercing in his side, that's the altar of incense, the piece of furniture right in the middle. And finally, the piercing in his head through the crown of thorns, that's the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, six piercings, six pieces of furniture, all for the number of man. He was wounded for, he was bruised for, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his, we are, he was pierced for us. Somebody say he was pierced for me. Okay, he was pierced for me. Now, you remember when Jesus taught on the Matzah. He's sitting down with his disciples. He is going through the Passover meal. He picks up the matzah. The Jews had three pieces, three separate pieces of matzah. They thought it stood for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their founding fathers. And they would take the middle piece and break it take half of the piece of, and wrap it in a little cloth, hide it, and send the children to go find it later as a game to return it. And whoever returned it received a gift. Jesus moves to the middle piece of matzah, picks it up, and breaks it, and then imparts a revelation. This is my body which has been broken for you. Now look at, a, if you've ever seen a pizza matzah, there are brown stripes and little pierced holes through it. He said, this is my body. I'm pierced, I have been whipped, and I am broken for you. He's wrapped up in linen, 
he's hidden away in a tomb. But he's telling them, I will come again. And whoever will believe me and receive my resurrection, I have a gift for you. It's called the Holy Ghost. Whew. My God, somebody needs to tell the Lord, thank you. Hallelujah. Tell him, thank you. He said, if I don't go away, the, the comforter can't come. The gift can't come. You get the gift after you understand that there's a resurrection. That's why the horns are on the altar. It symbolizes a resurrection. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord again. Just lift your hands and give him some praise for that. You are broken. You are pierced. Somebody needs to thank God for being broken and pierced for me. Whoo! Thank you for being broken for me, pierced for me. Now, if you're going to be like God, sometimes you're going to have to get broken and pierced for others. Can I say it again? If you're going to be like God, sometimes you're going to have to become broken and pierced for others. Parents have learned this, that many times their child breaks their heart and pierces them. They are broken and pierced for the benefit of the child. And when you become a tour in the Lord, you're going to be broken and pierced, whipped, crucified for others that they might live. How many want to be like Jesus? Amen. He didn't hide it from us, did he? He said, now if you're going to follow me, pick up your cross. No, don't pick up your feather bed. No, don't pick up your nice Thompson Chain Bible. No, don't pick up your laptop. Pick up your cross. Come follow me. What do you mean? I already went ahead of you. I've already done this. You're following in my footsteps. Amen? All right. Exodus chapter 30. I think we can get to the labor by the help of God. Verse 17 through 21. Let's begin to read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver and his foot to wash, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle, and, and thou shalt put, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle, of the congregation they shall wash with that they that they now you see this this stuff isn't optional the reason why some of you are dying right now spiritually is because you haven't washed at the labor all right let's read that again that they die not let's read or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they and it shall be a statue for how long forever to them even to him and to his seed throughout there he said hey you're not changing this if you're gonna live you gotta wash if you don't wash, you die. I love you. You're my child. I made you. I'll kill you. Come on, some of you parents have said that. I brought you in this world. <laughs> well, why wouldn't the ultimate parent be able to say that? All right, so... We need to see that this isn't just some little ceremony, some little ritual, some little casual approach. This was life and death. You didn't wash your hands and your feet. You had to wash both. You died. You were inside the tabernacle. You were on your way to the presence of the Lord. And if you didn't do it the way God said do it, 
Bye. Now, we need to start understanding now about the labor. Before we, we go further with the labor, uh, would you switch to the next one? I believe that one was um, nine, number nine. Switch to number nine for me, please. Yes, that just shows the foot of the labor. Now, there's something I want to bring out immediately about this labor. Number one, I want you to make note that while we were reading, we encountered no measurements. Did you notice that? No measurements were mentioned. Now, when we, when we read uh, uh, about the brazen labor, we were, or brazen altar, we were told it was going to be five cubits, it was going to be this. No measurements with the labor. Jesus, when pierced, out of his side came blood and? All right. When they offered up these sacrifices unto God, their hands many times were bloody. They were going to wash now in the laver. And there became a mixture of the blood and the water. This that Christ did on the cross is unmeasurable there is no measurements to the brazen labor it is unmeasurable what God did oh you need to write it down you need to write it down it is unmeasurable there's no measurements to the brazen labor to symbolize that the work of the cross is unmeasurable can't measure what he did There's no measurements to the brazen labor because it symbolizes that the work of the cross is unmeasurable. Now, the labor was made of special material. It wasn't just brass like the brazen altar. It wasn't the same kind. We're going to get into that because you need, to, you need to see this. When God had them put that labor down and the priests had to wash their hands and their feet, they were preparing themselves to go and minister to the Lord. Now, just like naturally, we talk about that you need to wash. You know, we tell our children as we're teaching them, if you don't wash, honey, no one's going to want to be around you. Because you will have an odor that is repulsive. So you need to wash. Well, the problem is we have trained our children to do that naturally. We do that ourselves naturally, but we don't wash spiritually. And we try to go into God's presence with an odor. that is repulsive to God. You try to bring in these attitudes that are contrary to God. And God says, no, no, you want me? Wash. Wash those things off of you. Get yourself in right position in order to receive me. Now let, let's go to the material that was used in this brazen labor. Exodus chapter 38. Exodus chapter 38. Exodus chapter 38 and in verse 8. Let's read this together. And he made the laver of brass and the foot of it of the looking glasses of the women assembling, which... Now this brass was made from the mirrors of the women. It was a tempered brass, a 
thin beaten brass that would reflect back an image. This is what the brazen laver was made out of. Women's mirrors. Because God, when you get ready to enter in, see, we're getting ready to go into the holy place. We're getting ready to go into the hidden places of God. Don't bring pride with you. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Oh. The laver symbolized, and, and, and we, need to, we need to get down into some of its symbolizations. Let's begin by going to the book of uh, Ephesians, chapter 5. Verse 25 and 26 of Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25 and 26 of Ephesians chapter 5. Now isn't this something, you know, we always get in our heads that what kept the priests and various ones alive was the blood. And that's true. Blood was very essential. But I, that's why I want you to really make note that if you didn't wash, you died. Now, initially, I'm just going to give this to you without trying to explain it per se. I think many of you will understand it. The altar, the brazen altar stands for repentance. The brazen laver, when you first enter into the tabernacle, really stands for baptism. Water and blood. But to the believer who consistently comes, because we don't get baptized physically every time. So then what does this brazen labor symbolize to me when I'm already baptized? And that's what I want to get into. Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. Let's read. The washing of of the water by what so that water and that brazen labor now symbolizes to us the Word of God and before you begin to go minister to him wash yourself in his word wash your mind wash your concepts in to or through his word the water symbolizes the word, the washing of the water by the word. Now, why are you doing this, Jesus? Verse 27, let's read. That he... Mm -hmm, that's why he wants you to wash. No blemishes. Nothing that is in the way between your soul and your Savior. You have made yourself clean. Now, let's take a look now at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Actually, I tell you what, I, I might get to that one again later. Let's go to James first. James chapter 1. Remember, this brazen laver is made out of the women's looking glass. It's made out of their mirror. So what is that to me as the believer? Verse 22 down through verse 25. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. 
Let's read this together. But be ye. Now notice this. When I look at the word, I'm looking at a glass, which means I'm looking at a mirror. The word is also the mirror. See, the reason why this was made out of the women's looking glass is so the priest could look into it and see where they needed to wash. The word not only shows you what you need to wash, the word is the detergent that washes you. So he says, now when you look into that glass, when a man comes to this mirror, looks into this glass, he's going to see himself. All right, verse 24. Uh huh. It is not enough to look into the word of the Lord. It, you must be a doer of that word. You must wash yourself with that word. I'd look into the word to see myself, where my faults are, where I'm wrong. But then that same word turns around and washes me. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. One thing I love about God, if God shows you your fault, if he reveals it to you, it's because he's ready to remove it. People will point out your faults and can't do anything about it. You've got a problem and then just leave you. But God, when he shows you that you got a problem, he also hands you the solution. One hand, he points the problem. The other hand goes, here's the solution. So the word shows you your problem and the word says, now here's your solution. You are washed by the word of God. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the word. Now, let's look at St. John chapter 15. St. John chapter 15. And in verse 3. Read. How are you clean? By the word. Now, I, I really just need to take my time here and let's talk to apostolics. What happens to us many times in truth apostolics, we don't know the word. We may know the doctrine, if, but very few of us go beyond the doctrine to really learn the word. That word washes you. That word cleanses you. That word reveals your sin and your iniquity. You must have the word. Don't you understand if you don't have the word, you're going to die? If you don't wash in that word, you're going to die with your Holy Ghost, with your, don't you understand that if you don't stop and wash yourself, don't you realize that when you go out into the world and you hear swearing and cursing and all this dirt and filth gets into your emotions and into your soul from everyday wear and tear, don't you understand you've got to go to the word and start to wash your mind of the concepts and the ideologies and the words and the feelings and the moods. Don't you know when you come into his presence and you want to minister to him, but you want to bring in rotten attitudes and back, you've got to stop at the word and say, I will rejoice. This is the day that you have made. I will rejoice. I will not be sad. I will not allow myself to be deterred. I'm going to have a praise because you are, I am washing myself in the word of the living God. 
And look what else he says, because you need to know something else about this word. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Actually, we'll start at verse 22 and 23. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. Together. Uh-huh, 23. Now, when we start talking about this labor, other than the, its initial meaning of baptism, we are now dealing with sanctification. Sanctification means to be washed. We are now dealing with the Word of God not only washing you, but it gives birth to you. You have been born from this Word. It is your origin. It is your keeper. It is your mainstay. God wants you to know His Word. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of God dwell in you. How? Friend, if you want to be rich in anything, be rich in the Word. Be rich in the Word. Learn the Word of God. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 16, or verse 6, My people are destroyed for thee. No, you're not destroyed by the devil. You're not being destroyed by your financial trouble. You're not being destroyed because your friends don't seem to like you. You are destroyed by what you don't understand regarding the Word of God. And God needs somebody to get down there and roll up their sleeves and wash themselves in His Word. I came to minister to you. I came to bless you. I came to give myself unto you. But I've got to stop by right now. And I understand before I get anywhere near that ark, I've got to wash with the Word. Now, let's go back to Psalm 51. Because, you see, I'm dealing with a washing, and I'm dealing with a washing that's going to prepare me for the service unto the Lord. Because once I'm done with that brazen labor, I'm on my way to the holy place. I'm on my way inside the holy place. Verse 2. Let's read. See, at the brazen altar, I have dealt with forgiveness. I have dealt with acknowledging my sin. It is also the place where I must ask God to teach me how to forgive myself. At the brazen laver, I'm getting all of that washed off of me. And how do I accept that washing because the word says so the devil says it's still there you failed you've done wrong you're nothing the word says but you are washed but you are clean but you are justified now whose report will you believe it's a mate you know sometimes saints of God are funny They'll come and talk to you, and they'll say, you know, brother, I know this is the devil. I know this is the devil talking to me. And then they'll go on to say, but I can't seem to shake this. I can't seem to shake that, that, you know, I did this wrong, and, and I can't get over it. Well, hold on, back up. You know it's the devil? Why are you even dwelling on it? Why are you even giving it the time of day? Why, why are you even thinking on it? How come you haven't shifted your mind over to the Word? How come you're not dwelling on what the Word says? How come your mind's not quoting back what God said? Why are you dwelling? You know it's the devil and you're dwelling on it? And then you want to know why you're confused? You want to know why you're depressed? You want to know why you're frustrated? You want to know why you don't feel God's presence? 
You want to know why you don't feel the Lord anywhere near you? How can two walk together except they? Mm -mm. So if you're not agreeing with him, are you walking with him at the moment? Then maybe that's why you're not feeling him. Shift your mind back to his word. This is why the Bible says, the entrance of thy word giveth light, it maketh wise the simple. This is why the psalmist said, give me understanding. He's talking about the word. He said, and I shall live. This is why he said, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed unto the word of the Lord. This is why he said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. You want to change the way you're speaking? You want to change the way you're thinking? You want to change your attitude? Put in the word of God. You don't need some more Freudian concepts. You don't need some more philosophical jargon. You don't need just some more experiential. You need to put the word into your spirit and then speak that word back out of your mouth until you begin to believe those things which you are saying. And when you believe what you are saying, it shall come to pass. You shall have whatever you are saying. But apostolics, let me tell you, we need to get some word in us. We've got folk that have been saved 20 and 30 years, and you have hardly, you've never even heard about a tabernacle of Moses. You don't even know about the tabernacle of David. You don't even know about the ashes of a red heifer. You don't even understand, amen, some of the formats of God. Oh, no, 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 no. When you want to grow up into the headship of a word, you've got to know the word. To know the word is to know God. To know God is to love God. To love God is to become like God. To become like God is to please God. God to be like God and to please God is to live with God forever thy word I need your word now God's not ignorant anything we want to learn from schooling or anything else we spend time with I don't know why when it comes to God we expect to, to get it through osmosis we want to lay our head down on the Bible and the, the information is filtered through the leather and right into our heads it's like anything else. You're going to have to apply yourself to the Word. Don't you understand? You're going to have to fight to read your Bible. You think the devil's just going to sit there and let you read? Don't you know that when you start trying to read your Bible, you always end up trying to join Cain in the land of Nod? It's the best night quill going. It's the best sleeping pill going. When all of a sudden you try to read your Bible. Now pick up anything else you want to read. Pick up Life magazine. Pick up any kind of sports. Pick up any kind of newspaper. But when you start picking up the Bible, all of a sudden your eyes start closing. You start yawning. Why is that? It's because the Word is life. These are the words that I speak unto you. They are spirit. And they are life. They will change you. And the devil knows it. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, give me a hunger for your word. Come on, ask God to hear tonight. We need a washing of the water by the word. Wash me in thy word. Now listen to what he said in Romans 12. We quote it often. Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Be how? Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect. Now, let me tell you why some of you are so frustrated. You are trying to find the mind of God and you've never renewed your mind. You can't know the will of God until your mind starts going under a renewing process. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, prove, test, know what is. You can't prove and test and know it until your mind has been renewed. When your mind becomes renewed, now you can start to know the will of God. Does anybody in here want to know the will of God? 
Now let's, let's look at some of these things. Let's go back to, now we'll go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Because we need to wash ourselves in the word. You know what? I didn't even finish um, Psalm 51 yet. I guess we need to finish that, huh? That would be a good idea. Let's finish Psalm 51 first, and then we'll go. Then we'll go to Second Corinthians 3. He said, "Now you're gonna. I, I need you to wash me. And see, this is what you pray when you get to that labor. Wash me. Verse seven. He talks about purge me with hyssop." And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be made. See, when, I, when I'm at that labor, this is the kind of prayers I'm, I'm thanking you for washing me. I'm, I'm being washed by your word. And you're making me whiter than snow. Nothing else can be laid to my charge. How many know that a believer, when God cleans you, you're clean? I want you to hear me real good, friend, because this is where a lot of us get into danger. We know something that somebody did 10 years ago. And we have the tendency to bring it up. Don't uncover what God's covered. Well, there was a situation within an apostolic organization. I couldn't believe it, and a whole lot of people couldn't believe it even happened. But God acted swiftly. The heads of the organization, one man who was the head 20 years prior, had committed adultery. He had repented. He had asked his wife for forgiveness. He had made restitution. He had moved on. It was sealed under the blood. He was washed. Someone got a hold of the information. One of the hierarchy ruling officials also got a hold of the information, brought it out, and made a whole new scandalous report about it. Within three months of doing that, he was dead. You never uncover what God has covered. And when that thing is washed, it's gone. So don't you let the devil bring it back up in front of your face anymore. Don't you let the devil make you feel ashamed of it anymore. But you look at the devil and say, I'm washed. Somebody say, I'm washed. Say, I'm clean. And so when you know you're washed and you're clean, you will not allow the enemy to stick that in your face and you will not allow the enemy to make you feel guilty or condemned any longer. You stand up like a child of God and you say, now I'm ready to minister. The whole purpose of them washing up this labor was preparation to minister unto the Lord. It was the release of their gifts. It was the release of their ministry to walk into the Holy of Holies and to minister unto God in a brand new dimension and in a brand new level. And that's why some of you can't do your ministries right Right now is you feel guilty you feel condemned you're not letting amen the blood wash you you're not letting the water cleanse you God said don't you know you're clean and it's not by your works but it's by my work clean through the word that I've spoken unto you clean through that word he said now purge me with his hop verse 10 create in me clean heart and renew a right spirit now i want you to notice this once he has made these kinds of prayers verse 13 then will i teach transgressors thy ways sinners shall be converted unto thee then i start to minister then i begin to move then i begin to deal with people in their life but do you see what he says in verse 13 uh, verse 12 or 13 Excuse me, 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. I, deliver me from the guilt of blood. Deliver me from the guilt and the shame of what I'm feeling, of what I've done to somebody else that's caused them hurt and harm. It's a powerful thing, friend, when you can be free in your mind. It's powerful when you can be free in your conscience. It's powerful when you can walk into the presence of the Lord, and even though you have done things that are wrong, you have taken the necessary steps to become clean, and you can wave your hands in the presence of God, and you can declare unto the devil, you cannot point a finger at me. You have no charges against me. All charges have been dropped. Jesus dropped the charges, and now I am free to open up my mouth, praise and worship my God with a lightness and a joy in my spirit. He said, this is where I need for you 
you to restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Man, when you've been washed, there ought to be joy. You can't tell me you're washed and you look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. You can't tell me you're washed and you act like someone just stepped on your toe. You can't tell me you're washed and you're acting like somebody that just chewed on some briars. If you're washed, there's some joy. Thank God for joy. There's joy when you're washed. There's joy when you're clean. Thank God for that cleansing. Would you lift your hands again and thank Him for the cleansing? Thank you for the cleansing, the washing of the water by the Word. I need to discuss this about the Word a little bit more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 now. We're making it there. Verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'm going to be honest with you, friend. Too many of us are too knowledgeable about everything else but the Word. You ask some people how to cook certain things, they spout the recipe out of their head. But the Word, they have no retention for. You ask some people about certain stats and figures of, of the Cincinnati Bengals or somebody, some other sports figure. They spout, they make this many touchdowns, they've done this many things. But about he who's the greatest superstar at all, they know little. But oh, to know thy word, to have a love for thy word, to spend time with the word of the living God. Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. Let's read that. But we all Now let's take a look at this. Let's break down what Paul is talking about. To understand what Paul is talking about, you're going to have to back up a little bit in the verse and see some of the things that he has to say. Verse 12 and 13 and 14. Let's read. Fourteen. Wow. So now we all with open face. The veil has been taken away. Don't tell me you can't understand the word. The veil has been taken away. You can the veil has been taken away. That's what he means by open face. There is no more veil. We all with open face behold the glory of the Lord. We look into a glass, into a mirror, and we behold the glory of the Lord, the works of God. Now look what he says. When you read the word of God, you behold the glory of God. What happens? You are changed into what you are seeing. You are changed progressively from glory to glory. How's this done? By the Spirit. So the Spirit takes the Word of God and starts to construct you into the image of God. This is why the devil wants you to be discouraged to read. This is why the devil wants to tell you that you're reading and you're wasting your time, you're not understanding anything, you're not getting anything. Why are you even bothering to read? Don't you understand that when you read, you just handed your spirit another brick? Don't you understand that when you study, you just handed your spirit a trough? 
Don't you understand that when you study and you read the Word, you just hand your spirit some cement. And it starts constructing, and it starts building, and constructing the image of the Almighty God. And that's how you start becoming like Him. But if the devil can convince you that the Bible is boring, if the devil can convince you, amen, that you don't understand it, then why bother to read it? Then you can't be made into His image. You can be saved for 20 years. You can have the Holy Ghost. You can do all the right things. But if you're not spending time in the Word, the Word makes a difference in the life. It's the Word. The Bible says faith comes by and hearing by. The faith does not come by singing. Faith doesn't come through your songs. Faith comes by hearing. That word hearing means an openness to the Word of the living God. That's why when the Word comes, the devil comes immediately. That's why even now while you're sitting here, some of you are fighting with your minds wandering. Some of you are fighting, amen, sleepiness. Why? As soon as the Word comes, doesn't matter who the preacher is, as soon as the Word comes, the devil comes immediately to steal that Word from you. And it's up to you to fight to keep the word. You gotta fight to keep your mind here. You gotta fight to reach out and get that word. You gotta tell the devil, I'm not letting go of this word. It's gonna change me into the image of, of God. That's why the, we're past giving you out handouts. That's why we're telling you to take notes. Because when you go away, the devil's going to try to steal the information. But you're able to go back over the notes and go back over the handouts and put it back into your spirit. But it's up to you to do that. You can leave this place and let the handouts. I've seen it. People just leave handouts sitting on the pew. Oh, that was nice. That's good. That's right. It didn't do you any good because you're not letting that word get into your heart. But when you want to be changed, is there anybody here that just wants to be changed? You just want to be like Jesus. Well, how does that happen? Word? Read, friend. Spend time with the Word. Spend time with the Word. It'll make, the Word will make a difference in you. Man, when you start getting enough Word in you, no matter what the trouble out of your mouth comes the Word. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth. And when you get into enough difficulty, out of your mouth comes the word. All of a sudden, the devil tries to act up, and out of your mouth comes, amen, that I am more than a conqueror. When the devil all of a sudden tries to form weapons against you, out of your mouth starts coming. No weapon can... Just comes up out of you because you've invested in you. I wonder what, does, what comes out of you when trouble hits because we know what's in you by what comes out of you when you're in fire. If negative things keep coming out of you, if you keep coming out with, I don't think I can make it, and oh my God, it's over, and my car just broke down, and, and, and I don't have enough money, and I don't know what I'm going to do now, I, we know there's not enough word in you. But friend, it doesn't mean that every time a trouble comes, you just quote a scripture, but you ought to have the concept of the scripture. You ought to be able to know what to apply. You ought to understand that, that everything that has breath. So when your car breaks down, do what? The Bible said, and everything give. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's not the time to mumble, grumble, and complain. The Bible said, do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in a perverse, amen, and crooked world. I want to know, are you harmless? Are you blameless? Or do you have negative things that keep coming out of your mouth? It's time to get the word in you. And when you get the word in you, you'll look back in the face of the devil like Jesus say, and you'll say, it is written. The devil cannot stand up against the word because the word is God. It's not some psycho jargon. It's not some psycho babble. It's not trying to outthink him. It's not trying to outmaneuver him. It's the word of the living God. It's arsenals that come up out of your mouth. 
The Bible said the word is nigh unto thee. It is even in thy mouth. When you start talking about deliverance, it's in your mouth. Watch Jesus. He's in the garden. They come for him. He says, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. The word was activated. And immediately, the Bible said they stepped back and fell on their faces. The word will make the devil kiss the dirt. The word will make them bite the dust. That's why he had to close his mouth. Dumb, he opened not his mouth. He went to the lamb to the slaughter and a sheep to the shearer. Why did you shut your mouth? In his mouth was the word. They never could have taken him as long as he opened up his mouth. If he opened up his mouth, angels would have descended. If he opened up his mouth, the earth would have shaken. The Bible said he made the hills and to skip like little rams. The word of the Lord is a deliverer. But you've got to get that word in you, in you, in you, in you, in you, in you. It'll transform you from glory to glory. It'll take you step by step and make you into the, the word will change your concepts. The word will stop you from being so selfish. The word will get you out of looking just at you. The word will make you to understand that you're not your own defender. The word makes you to understand that I am your shield and I am your defender. I will take care of you. I'll make ways for you. I'll open doors for you. I am your door. You don't have to look for a door. You don't have to create the door. Jesus said, I am the door. And when you get that word in you, something just rests in the midst of the storm. Jesus in the midst of the storm was asleep in the boat. And Friend, when you got enough word in you, in the midst of the storm, you can rest. Well, how did he calm the storm? He got up and spoke the word. How are you going to calm the storms of your life? Word. Say the word. Say I'm able. Say I can. Say I will through Christ. When that sickness and disease hits your body, what does the Bible say? He sent his word and he healed them. Look at what he says. Listen, because some of you, you're struggling right now in your bodies. The devil is attacking people in their physical bodies to offshoot their ministries that they do not have strength to perform what they were called to do. Now listen to what God has to say for you is your remedy. It's not Tylenol free. You say, are you speaking against medicine? No. But I'm telling you, there is something that you must put inside of you. When you start dealing with sickness and disease, you are not just dealing with a natural battle. You are dealing with a spiritual one. You are under attack. And some of it's happened because we've not always been wise. We've not always taken care of our bodies. We've not always eaten correctly. But friend, there's a word, and let's look at it. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. See what the wise man has to say about it. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 23. Let's read that together. My son... Keep the word where? It ought to be the center. All things that you do ought to be judged by the word. He said, now keep it in the midst of your heart. Why? Let's read 22 and 23. The word is health to your physical body. It is health to all of your flesh. If you are struggling physically with sickness, you need to get yourself some CDs, cassette tapes of the Bible. I have the Bible now on CD. 
nothing quite like it, dramatized with sound effects. So when you hear John the Baptist preaching, you hear the river of Jordan rolling by him. Have it on CD so I can play each, each chapter is on an individual track. So if I just want to listen to one chapter over and over again, I just put it on repeat and go to sleep with the word. When I wake in the morning, the first thing I'm hearing is word. My mind's not drawn immediately to problems. See, that's why some of you are struggling. As soon as you wake, bam, your mind hits a problem. That's tough to do when the word's playing. The word, bam, draws your mind right in. And God starts ministering to you right out of his word. It's a proven fact that you can learn in your sleep because your subconscious mind is yet awake while your conscious mind is yet asleep. And God will minister to you through the word. And you know your spirit's getting it. Because I've had times when I've just woke up, I, and how I woke is because I heard myself speaking in tongues. My spirit got excited over the word it was hearing while my mind was asleep. It is health to all of your The word is not just something, amen, to tell you how to repent and be baptized and, and be filled with the Holy Ghost and now that's it. Now I don't read my Bible anymore. No, no. The word is health to your physical body. Now look what he says now in verse 23. Let's read that. He said, now keep your emotions, keep your mind, keep your intellect. In other words, watch what keep, guard it. Watch what you keep putting into your mind. Be careful what you keep putting into your emotions. Put the word there. What starts to happen when the word starts swelling in you? You don't have to try to prime up a praise. You don't have to try to beg up a praise. All of a sudden the word creates a praise. Would you just lift your hands again and begin to give him some praise? Thy word. God, let me hunger after thy. Oh, young people, if God could just get the word in you. Hallelujah. God. God. God, I need the word. There's got to be somebody in here. I know it. I know you're in here. You want to know more than just Acts 2.38. There's somebody in here. You, you're tired of just having the basics and the fundamentals. There's somebody in here. You're tired of just the milk. You want some meat. You know you can't work on a hard day by just drinking some milk. You can't just, amen, have energy to perform the way you need to just when you're drinking. You need some meat. You need some solidness of the word of the Lord. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3. He said, I have fed you with milk and hitherto not with meat because you were not able to bear it. He said, you should have been able to take it. You should have been able to eat some meat, but I still have to give you milk. He told them in Hebrews chapter 5, he said, amen, in verse 12, he dealt with them. Verse 11, he said, you are dull of hearing. He said, for when you ought to be teachers, you still have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. He said, you still don't have down the word. Verse 13 and 14, he starts to deal with them. He says that strong meat, and before he does that in verse 14, giving what an adult, he says in verse 13, he says that he that is a babe is one that is unskillful in the word of God. No, no. A baby is not just by chronological years of how long you've been saved. No. A baby is how you handle the word. And if you've been saved for 25 years, unskillful means you scripturally cannot handle your problems. You are a baby. Unskillful means that when a problem rises, you don't know how to reach in and get the word and fix the problem by the word. That's a baby. He said, but strong meat belonging to them that are full of age. 
who have their senses exercised to discern both good and that's why in chapter 6 of Hebrews, verse 1, he said, Now therefore, leaving behind the principles of the doctrine, let's move on to perfection. That word perfection, maturity. The doctrine cannot perfect you. The doctrine was never meant to perfect you. Too many of you, you're too excited about the doctrine. You just stay on the doctrine. All you want to know is that you know the doctrine. Wonderful, but it can't perfect you. It can't mature you. It can't grow you up. It never was meant to grow you up. But the Word of God will grow you up. As you get further and deeper into the entrance of the Word of the Lord, it reveals to you truth. It shows you things that you've never understood before. God said, I want to know, is there somebody in here that's just hungry for some more Word? Now let's look. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. These are one of these scriptures I was talking to somebody earlier. Sometimes these are one of these scriptures that we quote again. And... Uh, we don't quote them right as far as content of what they mean. So I want you to see this because it has a relevance also to what we're teaching now. Jeremiah chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 7. Now this is Jeremiah talking to the Lord. I'm still on this brazen labor because we've got to get, you, can't, you can't wash yourself by the word if you don't get the word. And you can't wash unless you're willing to look into the Word, to the looking glass, the mirror of the Word. All right, now, chapter 20 of Jeremiah, verse 7. Let's read that. O Lord, thou hast, I was, thou art stronger than I. I have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone, you hear Jeremiah? Jeremiah says, I feel deceived right now. I feel absolutely deceived. I've, everyone's mocking me. Now, when he says everyone, he's not really, he's dealing a lot with, his, with God's people. God's people are mocking me. I'm giving them the word. I'm telling them, I'm doing what you want me to do. And they're mocking me. All right, verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. I cried out with what you told me to cry out with. If you read the verses above, you'll see that God had prophesied judgment upon them. I said what you wanted me to say, and all I'm doing is getting a derision. I'm just getting mocked. I'm being made fun of. Verse 9. Read. See, what happens to a lot of us, we keep quoting, like what Jeremiah says, like fire, shut up my bones. It's all, I'm all excited. No, did you just read what he's talking about? He's not talking about being excited. This fire is not excitement. He's feeling deceived. He's feeling mocked. He doesn't want to speak anymore. But look what he says. What is in my heart? What is in my heart? He said, the word was in my heart like a fire. I didn't want to talk anymore. I didn't want any more to do with this. But the word was so strong in me until it was like a fire that burned me. I want to know, do you got the word like that? You don't even feel like praising God. You feel maybe deceived because God hasn't even answered some of the prayers that you thought he would answer. But the word is such so strong in you. It's like a fire that you find your hands having to go up and open up your mouth and give God praise. He said, he goes on down, he's still talking about it. He, verse 14, he said, cursed be the day wherefore I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bear me be blessed. He's upset. <laughs> He's not talking about joy. He's upset. He's feeling mighty deceived. 
But man, there's something when you got the word in you enough that the word is like a fire shut up in your bones. I want to know, is the word in your heart that strong? Is the word of fire shut up in your bones like that? That things can go so wrong against you, but the word causes you to act in accordance with the will of God. Now, this is the kind of thing that God is looking for. This is the kind of people that God needs. You see, the priests, when they stepped in that temple, they were extremely knowledgeable of the ways of God. They understood the laws of God. They knew the laws of God. They were knowledgeable. How many know that you are a priest unto the Lord? How many know the Bible says you have been made both king and priest unto our God? Now as a priest, you are required to be knowledgeable of the laws and the ways of God. And it ought to be so strong in you, friend, that even when you don't feel like praising, even when you don't feel like, I don't know if you ever had this, you're just tired, you don't want to come to church, you know service is on, but you're just tired. And you're thinking, God, I'm not going anywhere. But while you're talking and talking about I'm not going anywhere, you done pulled out the iron and started ironing your clothes. And you're talking about, oh, man, I'm just so tired. And before you know it, you're washing up to get ready. And you're, I just should stay home tonight. And uh, you know what, you know, you got yourself dressed and, and you're already heading out the door. And while you're driving on the way to church, something raises up within you and says, I was glad. It's the word. It overcomes your feelings. It overcame your moods. It was like a fire. God's not concerned about a fire of joy as much as he's concerned about the fire of the word. Because you have a fire of the word, it'll bring a joy. Can you say Amen. Would you lift your hands and give God some glory right now and praise and honor right now? Somebody needs to ask God for the hunger of some word in here. Let me be a doer of this word. I don't want to just speak it. I want to do it. Let me do this word. Let me do this word. Let me do this word. Come on, we're just going to take a few moments and pray and talk to God right now. Come on, you need to digest this word. God, I want to hunger after your word. I want to hunger after your word. Thy word, thy word. I need your word, I need, I need your word, I need you. I need your word. Hallelujah. I was talking to some of the leaders in the other day, and one of the things that we covered, and, and, and I feel the Lord to put to, to go through this just briefly. I'm not going to go through what we went through then, but just one scripture in particular. First, uh, excuse me, St. John chapter 14, verse 26. Because what's happening to so many of you is you're saying everything opposite to the word, and you want to know why you're not being blessed, and you want to know why things continually to go wrong but your speech is contrary to the word. God will not bless someone who speaks contrary to his word. If you keep saying that you can't make it, why some of you are struggling right now is because all you keep confessing is how you feel. You keep confessing that you don't feel God. You keep confessing that I just can't seem to pray. That's all you keep saying. But the, that is contrary to Scripture. The Bible says, let the weak say. Okay, so you got a weakness over here. God didn't say keep talking about the weakness. He said, confess that you are what? Confess you can do it. I will pray. I want to pray. Stop confessing about how you don't want to pray. The more you confess that is the more you don't feel like praying. Start confessing that I will pray. I want to pray. I will cry out to God. I will focus on God. Speak the word. St. John 14, 26. Let's read that. But the comforter, which is, 
whom the Father, he shall teach you and bring Some of you right now, young and old, you're struggling with your memory. You can't remember where you put your keys. Come on, you can't say amen, say ouch. You don't remember where you put your wallet. You don't remember where you put that certain paper that you need. The Holy Ghost will bring back to your the Holy Ghost is your hard drive. The Holy Ghost is your data bank. Now, all God said is bring it up. Bring it up on the screen of your memory. How do you bring it up? You go to the Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you for bringing it back to me. And the Holy Ghost will bring it back to your... Stop confessing that you have a bad mind. Stop confessing that you have no memory. Stop confessing about how, how poor. Well, when I was younger, I really used to do well. Now, you know, old age, I guess. See, you can't be blessed talking opposite to God. You can't be blessed. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot be blessed and talk opposite to God. Some of you ain't mean, even in school. If you're not careful, the devil will have you confessing about this. I can't remember. I can't get it. It just won't stick with me. No. Holy Ghost is going to bring back to my... That's how I got through school. Because I went to God and said, become my memory. Don't you recognize this is an avenue of power? The devil's trying to make you feel embarrassed because you can't seem to remember anything. Shame the devil and plug yourself into the avenue of power. Tell the devil this is a greater opportunity for me to depend upon God. And in the dependence upon God, there is a release of more anointing and the release of more power. And so now because I'm depending upon God, God is going to empower me to remember. So now I'm not relying on myself, but I'm relying upon God. Even the youth will utter Utterly faint, but they that wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not. That's why I was telling some of the leaders yesterday, some of you, why you're so tired, that's all you confess. How tired you are. I'm always so tired. That's all you keep confessing. So that's what you keep getting. But I dare you to start confessing strength. I dare you to start confessing that the joy of the Lord is my. I wonder, does somebody have some joy in the house? It is your strength. Hallelujah. So when you start confessing with the word, you start washing yourself in that word. You start putting yourself into that word. My God, i got to cover this one other thing the Lord said to cover. Look at this. St. John, look at Numbers chapter 14. There's so much in my spirit right now, but I'm just going to do what the Lord says. In Numbers chapter 14. Listen, Israel in chapter 13, we're not going to look at it, but chapter 13, for those of you taking notes, verse 30 through 33, Israel was up against a battle. God sent in 12 spies into the land. And they came back with a negative, the Bible called it an evil report. What's an evil report? Anything contrary to what God says is evil. And God told them to go into the land. They could possess the land. Listen, they said, we are not able to go and possess this land. There's some of you right now, God's setting you up to get another house. I'm speaking to somebody by the Spirit. The bank says you can't do it. And you're now starting to confess it. We're not able to do this. The day that God is limited to a bank to give you money to get a house is the day that you need to find another God. Say amen, somebody. God is well able. But you got to say what God says. Now, in chapter 14, God heard all of this, heard all this boo-hoo crying, we can't make it. They said we are grasshoppers. 
in our sight, and so we were in. And that's what the problem with some of you have. You have a grasshopper mentality. You have a pygmy salvation. You see yourself as this small, scrawny little thing like some roach that the devil can just step on at will. You see, amen, when you go to the big challenges, you can't do it. All you know is what, I can't do it. I can't read this. I can't understand this. I can't do that. I can't speak well. I can't stand in front of people. Me stand in front, you gotta be kidding. There's no way. <laughs> You're funny, no. That's this grasshopper mentality you have. You are not washing yourself with the word. God tells you to go pray for someone. God tells you to go give someone a word. Well, what if I mess it up? Did you ever just jump to the other side of that fence? Well, what if I do it right? I mean, you let the devil make you dwell on the negative. What if you mess it up? What, what, well, devil, what if I do it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means I'm going to give you a couple of black eyes. So I just decided I'm going to do it right. I'm well able. Somebody say I'm well able. Say what God says. Say what God says. All right, God listened to all this negative speech, heard everything they had to say, what they couldn't do. Verse 26 of Numbers, chapter 14. Let's read. Now there comes the day when the Lord speaks. He was silent through all of this. And some of you, you've been speaking negative for so long, and God's been quiet. But there comes the day where the Lord speaks. 27. Do you know that when God listens to you talk about what you can't do and how you can't stand, God says you're being evil because you're talking opposite to him. You're so worried about the devil telling you what if you mess it up that you forgot that by talking opposite to God, you become evil. Amen. 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 He said, I've heard the murmurings of this evil congregation of how much they murmur against me. Verse 27. I'm going to read it again. Let's read it again. How long shall I bear? Verse 28. Oh, you say you can't do it? You keep saying you can't pray? You keep saying that you can't remember things? You keep saying how tired you are? You keep confessing that you don't have enough money? You keep confessing that you never have enough money to go on vacation like you'd like to? You keep confessing that you never have enough clothes? I'm going to do what you're saying. Done. Granted. Here you go. Don't, don't worry about the devil. I'm doing it. I'm going to give you what you've been saying. You've been saying that you're a weakling. You've been saying that you don't know how to pray for people. You've been saying that you can't be used by God. Done. You've been saying about how unhappy you are. You've been saying that you never have any joy. Nothing ever goes right for you. Why do I always get the cheap end of the stick? How come I'm always the low man on the totem pole? Everybody always wipes their feet on me. It's not fair. I never get anything I want done. God said, now I dare you to start confessing that the blessings will overtake you. I dare you to start to confessing that blessed shall you be in the city. And blessed shall you be in the field. And blessed shall you be in the country. And blessed shall be your storehouse. And blessed shall be the fruit of your basket. And blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. 
I dare you to start saying that and see if I won't do that. Hallelujah. I dare you to start confessing I have joy. Let the weak say, I am. Wash yourself with that word. The devil says, well, you're lying. You don't feel that. Hold on. You, you only keep talking from one side. You keep talking from your flesh. And that's why you don't feel it. Your spirit always has joy. You have a Holy Ghost within you. The Bible says there's righteousness, joy, and peace are in the Holy Ghost. How many have the Holy Ghost in here? That you have joy. You have peace. And you have righteousness. It's in. Somebody believes God. It's in. I want to know what side are you talking from? The problem from us, we keep talking from the side of our flesh. Don't you know you have a Holy Ghost within you that always wants to pray? You have a Spirit of God within you that always wants to come to church? You have a Spirit of God in you that wants to lift His hands and wants to open up and give God glory and give God praise? And you keep talking from the side of your flesh that you're not in the mood to praise God. You're not in the mood to give Him praise. You're not in the mood to smile. I don't got nothing to smile about. Ah, but I heard the psalmist when he he said, amen, when I think. He said, when I think on the goodness of Jesus, ah, he wrote the song and said, all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. And that's why David wrote as the psalmist, uh, he said, I had fainted unless I had seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's why he said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say. That's why some of you are fainting and you can't wait because you won't look at his goodness. The looking at his goodness gives you the ability to wait when I see how good he's been. The fact that he woke me up this morning. The fact that when I got up, I was still in my right mind. The fact that I can move my legs and move my feet. The fact that I know my way from my bedroom to my bathroom. Hey, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will read. Woo! I feel an unction to function. I will rejoice. Hallelujah. God said, is there anybody in the house that will say I'm good? Somebody say God is good. When you get up in the morning and you start on your day, your car might not start, but that doesn't control your joy. Your joy is always running. It's ever ready. Your joy is always going. It never stops. You can't control my joy by a car. You can't control my joy by a job. My joy is on Jesus, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, my joy, he is the same. Tell somebody, I have joy. And all God wants to know is there's somebody in the house that's going to stand on the word of the living God. Some of you are trying to find the will of God for your life, but you've not stood on the written will of God. God said it's the will of God that you give thanks in everything. Give me some thanks. Give me thanks. That's how you enter in. Give me thanks. I know you might not have enough money, but just lift your hands and say thank you. I know everything might not be right, but just tell me thank you. I know your child might be acting up. I know your spouse might not want to live for me, but tell me thank you. Oh, somebody tell them thank you. Listen real good, my friend, because God is ready to take us to, to the next level. And God is telling us tonight that even though you have struggles and even though you have problems, and you do have them. He's not ignoring them. He's not trying to tell you you don't have them. 
He's not trying to say they don't exist. He's not trying to say it's a figment of your imagination. He's not calling an elaborate 3D hologram. He is saying, I know it exists. I know you have difficulties. I know you have problems. But I also gave you a weapon. And would you please use it? He's looking at Moses, and Moses is standing at the Red Sea. Pharaoh is coming behind him, and he's locked in the land. He's got three million people trying to follow him. He starts crying unto the Lord. The Lord looks back at him and says, Wherefore criest thou unto me? What is in your hand? He said, Well, a rod. Well, he said, Would you stretch it forth? Use what you got and go forward. God said, I put a word in your mouth. Stretch out that rod of the word out of your mouth and part your Red Sea. Tell the devil that what should destroy me, God's going to make it deliver me. What the enemy meant for evil, God's going to make it for my good. Tell the enemy, I am more than a conqueror. You can't take me down because I'm going up. I'm made just like my daddy. Tell the enemy, greater is he that's within me. You might be struggling right now. You might not know where all the answers is, but I challenge you to speak the word. I challenge you to look at your own physical body with your bones aching and arthritis trying to set in heavy and look at your body and say, Hear ye bones the word of the Lord. I am healed by his stripes. I am delivered by his word. I am cleansed by his word. Does anybody believe the word? When you believe the word, you don't have to wait for the battle to be over to start to shout. When you believe the word, you don't have to hold the answer to have a dance. When you believe the word, you don't have to wait for God to open the door before you get excited. When you believe the word, you can shout right now. You can dance right now. How do you dance? I dance on the word because the word tells me I am the winner. I read the back of the book and I win. You know, in school, sometimes we used to do that when we really liked a book and we were anxious on how it ended. We go to the back of the book and read it. And I want to tell you something. I went to the back of the book and I found out that I win. I found out that when Jesus returns back, amen, on his white horse in Revelation chapter 19, his saints are with him. A sword comes out of his mouth. King of kings and Lord of lords, he has many crowns. The word of God is in his thigh. Ah, he comes back charging on a white horse and puts the enemy under his feet. And I'm following right behind him. I am with him. Are you going to be with him also? Yeah, you are the winner. This is why he said, ye that are holy, be holy still. This is not a time to quit. This is not a time to give up. But it's a time to bend over and wash yourself in that word. The word of God is going to create in me the image of the almighty God. I shall be just like him. Strong, mighty, resilient, well able. And I'm going to walk through fire. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. I'm not going to fear any evil. I'm not going to worry about the opposition because thy word have I hid in my heart. God needs for somebody to wash yourself in the word right now. I want you to get a problem that you've been concerned to match the problem and start to thank me for the answer. Hallelujah. Thy word. It is the word that created the world. It is the word, word that spoke worlds into dimensions and into existence. It's the same word which you read and have now. And if this word can speak worlds into dimensions, this word then can change you. And some of you, the devil's trying to make you feel like you can't be changed. Like every time you take three steps forward, you take two steps back. But you tell the devil you are a liar. I am being changed from glory to glory. As by the Spirit of the Lord, because I believe thy word. 
Come on and give him some praise in the house out of your mouth. Come on, give him glory. Somebody believes the word in here. Somebody believes the word. Come on, your child is not living godly, but somebody believes the word. Whoo! Oh, come on, young people, lift your hands to your God. Come on, he's your God, he's your God, he's your God, he's your God. Somebody believes the word. Somebody believes that when they praise, God says, when you praise me, I inhabit your praise. Come on, if you believe that word, open your mouth and praise him. He lives in your praise. Hallelujah. 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 I'm opening up this altar right now by the Spirit of the Lord. There's some of you, you're sick in your body. There's some of you, you've got some very serious concerns on your mind. And God's calling for you right now. There's some, you know who I'm really calling for by the Spirit? I'm calling for those of you that are worried. Whether it's over your bodies, whether it's over finances, whether it's over children, whether it's over something else in your life, whether it's over a job decision, whether it's over whether you should move or stay, you're worried. And God is calling for you. Because he said, be anxious for nothing. Don't be worried. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep, that word keep, guard, garrison, fortress, becomes a fortress around your heart and your mind. Come on, as we give God some prayer right now, the Lord's calling for those of you that are worried. There's some of you that need salvation in here. God's calling for you. God's calling for you. God's calling for you. He's calling for you. He loves you. Not here to condemn you or beat you up. He loves you. But it's time to wash yourself in the word. It's time to wash yourself in the word. Time to wash yourself in the word, friend. Yes, you have difficulties. Yes, you have troubles. But wash yourself in the word. I want you to do this as you're coming up here. Just listen to me just one moment so that we can approach together and get answers from God. The first thing we need you to do, whatever it is you're really worried about, maybe it's more than one thing, and in many cases it is, I want you to take some time right now and tell God, what is it that's worrying you? What is it that's making you so afraid? For some of you, it's fear of failure. You're just afraid you're not gonna make it. You're just afraid you're not gonna do it right. But whatever it is, tell God right now. Come on, you tell him. This is what I'm afraid of, Lord. This is what I'm worried about. This is what scares me. <sighs> Hallelujah. This is what's bothering me, God.
Toda, God. It's time to offer these problems to God. You know how to toda by now. Your hands are low, cupped around your waist. Both hands are out. You're bringing it to God. You're bringing it to God. I want you just to visualize it. Whatever it is, if it's your children, your finances, your spouse, you're bringing them to God right now. Your own fear of failure, whatever it is, you're bringing it to God. Come on, just tell the Lord, I give it to you. I offer it to you. I give it to you. You're the only one that has the solution. You're the only one that can handle it. You're the only one that can do this thing. I can't do it. Come on, tell him. I can't do it. I can't handle it. This is yours. I can't fix this, God. I can't fix this for my children. I can't, I can't fix this situation. I give it to you. Now you're lifting those hands of Toda straight up now in the air as you offer. You have given it to him. I give it now to you. It is now yours. Receive it from me. Receive the burden of it. Receive the responsibility. I will do what you tell me to do about it. It's yours. Whew, my God, I feel the presence of the Lord. Somebody is getting lighter. Somebody is finding release. My God. Hey, it's yours. Now turn your hands out, palm words towards the sky. You're yah dying, God, now. You're throwing javelins into the camp of the enemy. You are a soldier. You are a warrior. You are a fighter. Hey, glory. Koto shokotaya. You cannot keep me down with this. I'm a fighter. You can't make me lose sleep over this. I'm a warrior. You won't make me lose my appetite. I'm a fighter. I'm a soldier. Shaka talabo soko. Glory. I want you to get ready to repeat after me because we're getting ready to put that word on. We're getting ready to just wash ourselves with that word right now. Say, Lord. Oh, come on. Say it like you know it. Say, Lord. I believe your word. Your word says that I am more than a conqueror. And I believe what your word says. Your word says that I am well able to handle all problems through Christ, which strengthens me. And I believe your word. 
Your word says, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn. And Lord, I believe your word. Your word says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. I believe your word. I believe your word. Hey, if you believe that word, start to praise him. You believe that word. Open your mouth. Begin to praise him. Woo! I believe your word. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. Now repeat this because some of you really need this. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord, you promised to teach me how to profit and to lead me in the way that I should go. This scripture is Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. And I believe that you are my mentor, my teacher, and my instructor. I receive you as one that will direct me and will show me the things to do. Father, you said you are my shepherd and I shall not want. I receive that. I believe that you will take care of me. And I thank you for provision. And I thank you for protection. And I thank you for guidance. I receive what your word says. Now, Lord, from this time forward, by your help, through your spirit, I will speak what your word says. I will not speak after my flesh. I will speak after my spirit. According to your word, I am able. 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 Oh, open your mouth and praise him. Who cut the circle? I am able. Say that word, say that, my God, I'm able. Now as you lift your hands, you are praising God for the truth of that word. I praise you for your word. I praise you for deliverance. I praise you for bringing me out. I praise you for keeping me. I praise you for being my mentor.
My God. My God. Finally, I want you to quote with me Psalm 144, verse 1. We're going to put it this way. Just repeat after me. Finally, Lord, you promised to teach my fingers how to fight and my hands how to war. And I receive that you shall teach me how to fight no matter what the situation is and you have already promised that I have the victory. I am not fighting to get the victory. I am fighting to maintain the victory. Victory is mine. I am a warrior. I am a soldier. I am armed and dangerous. I have great weapons. My weapons are praise. I'm lethal when I praise. My weapons are prayer. I am lethal when I pray. When I open my mouth and I call your name, demons tremble. When I open up your, my mouth and call your name, sickness and disease bows. My weapons, joy. The devil has no power to put sorrow upon me, for I have joy. I am a warrior. I will not go down. I am a fighter. I will not quit. I am able to do all these things, for you are my teacher. I am your student, and I'm an overcomer. I am an overcomer. Somebody let the tongues of the Holy Ghost out of your mouth. Shaka toko tolobo shoko. I want to just tell you with us one thing. The world has learned that this works while the church feels like it's odd to do. When I was going in college and was looking at possibly selling vacuums to help myself go through, they told us when we went in that if you will get up every morning, look in the mirror and say, I am going to sell whatever the number was, five vacuum cleaners today, that they found that the people who consistently sold the most vacuums were the ones who would get up every morning and would speak what they would do. Now, if the world has learned that to sell vacuums, why do you think it's so odd that we should say we're going to overcome? I'm going to overcome. Somebody say, I'm going to overcome. Say, I am an overcomer. Would you just lift your hands and thank God now? Just take some, everybody all over this building, stand to your feet, everybody. It's time to give God praise all over this house. Come on and give God glory all over this house. Come on, give him praise all over this house. Glory, glory, glory. 
Will you be fought after this? Yes. The enemy will try to fight you and discourage you. But God challenges you to say what he says. Just say what he says, friend. And know that you're an overcomer. We're getting ready just to take our offering right now on, the, on your way back to your seat. Just tell somebody, I'm an overcomer. Just tell them I'm an overcomer because God said so. I'm an overcomer because God said so. That's all. I'm an overcomer because God said so. I'm an overcomer because God said so. Ushers, would you make sure the offering plates are up here on the front? We're just going to have everybody bring their offering unto the Lord. Just make sure the plates are here in the front. We're going to bring our offerings unto the Lord. And we're going to close with the bringing of our offering unto God. Just bring the offering plate to the front. I don't, I don't see two. Maybe we can get one more up here. Thank you. Yes. No, brought. Brought. Now this is what we're going to do. Amen. We're going to just bring our offering as we did. We're going to bring our offering with joy unto the Lord. Get your offering in your right hand. Now come on, bless the Lord. If the Lord has blessed you tonight, bless God. Now you give in accordance to how you also want to be blessed. If you're just going to give little one dollar and quarters and fifty cents and two dollars, with what measure you give, it shall be measured unto you again. But if you need more than a two dollar blessing, give more than two dollars in the offering. Say amen, somebody. Amen. That's the word. You see, that's the word too. <laughs> Amen. And so we're going to bless the Lord. Let's stand to our feet as soon as you have your offering. We're going to start right with the middle aisle, just like we did before. Come, bring your offering to the Lord. Just come right from the back. Come right to the front right here. Amen. And bring your offering to the Lord. Come on, everybody in the middle aisle. Just come right from the back and start to bring your offering unto the Lord. Wave your offering to God. The, the Bible talks about it being a wave offering. We're giving something out of joy and with love unto the Lord. And we're waving and just giving our offering unto the Lord. We're not trying to show off to somebody what we're giving. We are in the Word. We're waving and we're giving an offering unto of the Lord. We're just giving an offering unto God. Come on, bless God. Bless God. Bless this work, bless this ministry, bless this revival. Amen. If this revival has been blessing you, then bless the work of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Those of you on the sides now, come on. Start from the back, from the other side. Start right from the back. Bring your offering unto the Lord. Right here on this, that's right. Start from the back. Bring, wave it unto God. Come on. Thank him for the privilege of giving it. Lord, thank you for the privilege. You gave me strength to be able to give. You supplied the finances for me to have. And I want to say thank you for letting me be able to give. Thank you for causing me to be able to give. Thank you, Lord God. What a privilege. What a privilege. What a privilege. Somebody needs to thank God for the privilege of giving. Come on, don't look like you're in pain when you're coming to give. God loves a cheerful giver. That's the word. Woo! Thank you for giving. Thank you, oh God, for the privilege of giving. My God, what a privilege. Amen. We thank you for your liberal giving. We're going to be dismissed. We want to remind you that tomorrow prayer begins at 5 and the service begins at 6. Come and let's be blessed. We're going to be going inside the holy place. You don't want to miss it. We're going to begin at the candlesticks, and you're going to understand some of the mysteries that are wrapped up inside of the holy place as it relates to you. For when we start into the holy place, you start into the place of power. So you don't want to miss it, friend. You want to get an understanding of what I'm to do inside that holy place. Amen? Would you stand with us right now? Dr. Cobb, would you come forward and dismiss us, please?
Lord, we stand amazed at your talent, at your abilities, at the wonderful things that you have prepared for your people. We stand amazed at what you're able to do with us, for little is much when you are in it. And Lord, as we have presented ourselves and as we have presented offerings to you, we know that you are going to multiply, not only monetarily, but you are going to take what we have offered you and you're going to turn fear and worry and anxiety and sorrow and mourning into joy and rejoicing and victory and conquering. We believe that you are going to turn bad into good, negative into positive, because we believe your word. I ask you to keep us safe and bring us back with rejoicing and thanksgiving and praise as we come back to your house tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.